Jim's in here with uh, Mike on tour, Matt's of course, one of the bands on the Honda Civic Tour alongside Blake and Matt and Kim. Uh, thanks guys for taking the time to come out here and talk to me. Um, you know, I was thinking about the Honda Civic Tour, I was looking at, at, at bands that have been play, playing on it in the past, and they've certainly had uh, an impressive collection of bands, it, but, but it's been a pretty eclectic collection. But this is the first time I've really seen so many high-powered bands on one tour. Usually the Honda Civic Tour revolves around one kind of big-time band. Right. You guys clearly are at the point in your careers where you could have carried this tour on your own. Were you at all hesitant to share the billing with Blink-182, being that they're, they're such you know, a big band as well? Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, when it started, uh, it was kind of one of those things where Blink just kind of called us up and was like, you guys want to tour together. And, uh, and that's how it, how it all started. Yeah, the Honda Civic, they came in much later. So uh, when uh, when Tom had originally approached us about it, you know, we were like, oh, wow, that'd be really cool. Like, you know, we don't really have anything going on this summer. We knew we wanted to tour. And... Uh, and you know, just the uh, the chance to, to get to, to play with them, I mean, it was kind of one of the things where we were like, all right, that'd, that'd be really fun. I mean, that, I, you know, not not to, to blow too much smoke up your guys' ass, but that's impressive to think that you guys would take a step back in a sense, because like I said, you, at this point, you should be headlining most shows that you play, uh, and uh, there's got to be a large contingency of the crowd at every one of these shows that is coming to see Blink-182. Right, well, that's a, that's like the reason we take these things, you know, we've always taken them. We took them on Black Parade, uh, we did Project Revolution with Lincoln Park, because it's great to be able to play in front of somebody else's fans. I mean, that's how we started, and for most of our career, that's actually what we did. We just played for other people's fans, even from the beginning. And that's kind of our thing. Like, we really like doing it. Have you, uh, would you guys look at Blink-182 as a band that's been influential to you guys, you know, growing up? Absolutely, yeah. They're definitely one of those bands, you know, grew up listening to, and uh, started in a van, touring, you know, and just like, kind of got in a van and did it, you know. Very cool. Yeah, and I, you know, I was thinking about how the music industry has changed, and you guys, you know, with your start being right around the, the, the beginning of the 2000s, um, you really had your career right in the smack dab of the most one of the most transitional periods of the music industry. Yeah. Um, do you, how, how are things different for you guys as far as from the business aspect of it? I mean, because I think when you when you started, you make a record and then you tour to support that. Now it seems like you you make you you tour for a living, right. and a record is kind of just a byproduct. It's weird. I mean, we, we, we definitely still don't operate that way. We still operate as we've always just wanted to, which is like we put, some, put a lot of time into something that we really like, and then we tour on it until we don't want to tour on it. So I know there's all kinds of methods and models of people of alter things and overdoing it with social network and having to tweet the date for lunch in order to keep your families, but we don't really subscribe to that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, for us, it's just like we just like making art together. And we're always going to put it out. Maybe we'll put it out different ways, but we won't let like the business dictate because it never did. You know, back then, people were, you know, selling multi platinum albums and we were giving away our music. Uh, you know, so we were always doing it differently. Actually, speaking of the times when you guys were giving away your music, I, I saw you guys play in New Brunswick in front of like nine people. Oh, that's right. In like oh, 2001. Yeah. I think I talked about, about you with you guys when you were in the studio yeah. with Kevin B. And so it's so strange. I mean, it's it's actually nice to feel like you're you're watching the progression of a band's career yeah. from from absolute ground zero right. to, to the point where you're at now. Right. Uh, is there any bands that you've kind of seen along the way that you think are going to be the next band to come you know out of the, out of the ashes and, and be the next big rock band? Uh, you know, it's, it's crazy, like, getting to tour a lot, you, you see a lot of great talents, you know, there's, there's bands that we toured with way early on, and we're like, this band has to be huge, like, there's a band, uh, Moments of Grace, that we toured with, oh, yeah, yeah. so yeah. early on, and made such an incredible record, and it just didn't connect in some way, and I don't know why, you know, but, uh, you, know, you get to see uh, a lot of great bands every day, like, uh, there's a band, The Architects, from, from Kansas City, that's amazing, um, there's a band right now from Jersey called Titus Andronicus. That thing's amazing. You mentioned you, know, you mentioned Jersey. You guys like where you come from, and, and it, I think ten years ago, when you're getting your start, uh, there's not not only is it different to sell music, but it's also different to kind of market your music. In that you know, it seemed like there was scene, there were scenes back then, right? And, and I mean that in a good way. You know, I grew up here in LA actually, and there was a scene, and there was a local scene, certainly a local scene in Jersey at the time. It was actually really exploding in the early part of the 2000s. Do you think with the internet making it so much easier to get your music out there it's also kind of destroyed the idea of like the hometown scene 
Um, maybe a little. I mean, well, that video you showed, he was just mentioning Titus and Andronicus. The video they made is very interesting to watch because it actually looks like a snapshot of a scene that nobody knows is really going on right now. And that's kind of exciting. So I, it looks like there's this other kind of different Jersey scene happening right now. Maybe it's just harder to find, you know? I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think the, the bigger local scenes have just gotten gone global mm -hmm. and uh, I think they're, they're harder to find because they want to be but I think they're still there yeah uh, and these little pockets of of, uh, of friends really just putting on shows for, for each other mm -hmm. you know? but I think uh, a lot of those because everything's so accessible these days kind of want to stay even farther under the radar yeah I mean it, there is there is an upside too though I mean it may yeah. destroy that scene but at the same time a band from the backwoods of Virginia or right. Georgia they can get the same kind of global marketing right. that right. any band right. could now yeah. you know you don't have to be from Manhattan or I think Hollywood. it's important though to uh, I don't know because another problem with the with that is like you know sometimes you're not ready like what if you know what if we had tons of like we didn't have YouTube when we started like right. imagine if we had like you'd see some and all you know I loved all of our shows and we definitely progressed mm -hmm. and grew and I think when it was time for us to be on TV is the first time that people saw us globally but is is there value to that in like having to really climb those slimy rugs and work and oh, yeah. play to nobody Absolutely. and then tour and because it, not only does it teach you more about you know being a musician but also kind of makes you grow balls to deal with the you is know that, the rigors of the industry yeah I mean and I meet bands that are far younger than us and far smaller bands all they do is talk about business yeah. and that's not something that ever happened to us because we we climbed up you know the, a mountain of slime to, to kind of try to get here and sure you have those ups and downs together you grow up together uh, you learn each other's personalities we have year, we've had years of experience to do that in a van with no internet or anything so I think that that you know I'm not trying to sound like a funny thing no, no, but you're, but you're exactly right. And uh, last question, I hate to see, see, ask like, such a cliche kind of yeah. journalisty question, mm -hmm. but the, the the critical acclaim around your last two albums has been so much. I mean, it's been so high, and rarely, especially with rock music, has there been a band uh, like MCR who's, who's been so you know, you know universally uh, well regarded with their with their last two studio albums. It, it does that create a different level of pressure every time now you guys start to think about writing new music? Um, yeah, I mean. It, yeah, you can't let it in though. That's right. you know, that's the problem. Right. I think the the amount of pressure is what you make. You know, if you're if you're making a record to impress the the people that you reach the last record or the people that are you know writing reviews about it, then right. then yeah, that's going to be you know overwhelming. You're ultimately going to fail. You know, trying to, to meet these expectations. But uh, if if you if you really just the, you set the the bar yourselves, then anything you make, if you, as long as you you do it with 100 percent of what you got, you know, you're gonna be proud of. All right, all right, fair enough. I actually lied. I have one more question, and I want a serious answer. Uh, Jersey pecking order, you guys give it to me right now with uh, Bon Jovi, Springsteen, My Chemical Romance. Oh well, make the order. <laughs> I think I think it's a widely known pecking order that probably all of the bands involved would would say. You know, it's Springsteen, Springsteen Jovi. Jovi. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jovi. Uh, we've had actually really really awesome. Uh, we've actually had really awesome experiences with um, with Bon Jovi. They invited us to play. They're, they're amazing guys. They invited us to come open that arena with them in Newark. And got to play two nights with them. They, they played a, a week of sold out shows, and it was you know, the sweetest guys. They got us these leather jackets and stuff. It was super awesome with them. Hey, it's got to, especially when they buy you something like a, like an article of, yeah. of clothing, because yeah. those guys right. still looking pretty pimp. Yeah, they, they looked really good. When they gave us the. We look like garbage pail kids. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all standing there and they look immaculate looking. Yeah, it, it is almost impossible how good Richie and, and, and John, especially, yeah. look in person. They're like, oh, great. that's all fair. Yeah. Yeah. You're 30 years old than me and really <laughs> a lot younger. Uh, guys, honestly, thanks so much uh, again. Appreciate right it. Thank you. Have a fun Thank night. Thank you. Thanks, man. Take it easy.